Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, something called moment matching polynomials. And this is joint work with Raghu Mecca. And I should say that um, one of the applications of this work was um, independently discovered by Daniel Kane. So I'll mention him. And the question, um, the main question that I'm looking at in this talk is a pretty basic one. It's you're, you know, given a function and you'd like to understand does there exist a low degree, uh, so we're also given a distribution D on Rn. And you'd like to understand, you know, when there exists a low degree polynomial P that approximates F with respect to D. And I'll I'll describe the notion of approximation in just a second. But the main application, uh, so there are lots of reasons to study a question like this, but the typically the application that I'm interested in is to learning Boolean functions. And there are many scenarios where um, it suffices to prove a statement like this in order to get an algorithm for uh, learning a class of functions f with respect to this particular distribution. And you could ask, well, what do you mean by learning a function um, if you're familiar with the pack model of learning a function from random examples, that's fine. We'll also talk about um, the agnostic model of learning, which is a model of learning where it's like the pack model of learning, but there's some adversarial noise. Uh, so let me just um, give an example of, uh, so uh, I should say that in this particular talk, um, just looking ahead a little bit, uh, pretty much all previous work has kind of looked at this problem uh, with respect to particular types of distributions, um, for example, the uniform distribution on the hypercube, or if um, D is just a Gaussian on Rn, typically they're distributions um, that induce some sort of product space. And what we were interested in doing was um, figuring out a way to work for, uh, to come up with polynomial approximators for functions with respect to really broad classes of distributions, in particular to distributions that aren't product spaces. Um, and you know, hopefully we'll see some applications to like learning with respect to log concave distributions. Um, so uh, one example, which is um, it's lineal, it's an old you know, Mansour Nissan, almost something like 25 years old. Um, so for example, they prove that if F is uh, a circuit, a Boolean circuit of size S, depth d, then there exists a polynomial p um, of degree roughly order log s over epsilon to the d, such that expectation with respect to x drawn uniformly from the hypercube of f minus p squared is less than or equal to epsilon. Um, so this paper, I think, is the first one that um, observed that if you can prove the existence of these low-degree polynomial approximators for a class of Boolean circuits, then you can get a learning algorithm uh, for this class of circuits. So uh, there are many things. Uh, it's a great paper. There are many things that were done in this paper. One is um, so they sort of made this connection 
between polynomial approximation and learning And there are two um, important technical issues that they address in this paper. And one is, you know, how to prove such a P exists. And then what's the algorithm for finding P? Given random examples. So, um, um, the algorithm for once you have this, this kind of structural statement about this class of circuits, the algorithm for finding P, P is what they prove is that, you know, P is the, the Fourier polynomial. And uh, the way you find this particular Fourier polynomial, if it's of degree d, is you estimate all of its Fourier coefficients. There are roughly n to the d of them. Um, the way I like to rephrase it is that they're basically a kind of um, they're solving the following optimization problem. You're trying to find the minimum over all polynomials p such that de the degree of p is at most d. Expectation of f minus p. Squared. And this is a, um, so this is a simple optimization problem to approximately solve. Um, so maybe this is the um, easier part of the paper, but still important. And then proving that such a P exists for this particular class of circuits, um, they use a method of random restrictions um, and Hofstad's switching lemma in order to prove that um, such a polynomial exists. Okay, so this is, um, Um, so this is one example that I wanted to talk about. Um, and then, um, you know, so after you have this, then a natural question to ask is, well, I'm given some uh, function class f and um, some distribution. You know, how do I, um, uh, they were able to prove such a statement for Boolean circuits. How do I kind of more generally prove that a particular function class has one of these polynomial approximators? And um, a, a useful tool, another useful tool for doing this was to um, examine the noise stability. of the function class. Um, so I'm just giving some background here. So uh, in 2002, with um, O'Donnell and Servideo, we showed that if uh, f um, is sufficiently noise stable, so if every function f, if every function in this class is sufficiently noise stable, Um, then there exists a low degree polynomial approximator for all functions in the class. Um, and once it's a simple observation, and once you make this observation, then um, you can really uh, start to examine various function classes and try and prove that they're just noise stable. And then using this simple observation, you can prove that there's, I mean, you can conclude that there's a, um, a polynomial approximator for that function class, and therefore you can learn that particular function class. So in this paper, we are interested in um, F was the class of um, half spaces, and actually, more precisely, intersections of half spaces. And there's been, a, you know, I guess over the last, I would say, 10 years, there have been many papers. Um, I think, like, Daniel Kane himself has written half a dozen papers. Um, 
uh, along with many co-authors, kind of analyzing the noise stability of various function classes over, and, and not just with respect to particular to like the uniform distribution on the cube, also in Gaussian space, um, and really trying to understand when a function class is noise stable. And once you can prove that, then you kind of automatically get a learning algorithm for free. Okay. And, um, so one sort of last um, background note I wanted to make. So in in 2005, with Kalai, um, Mansour, and Servideo, we showed that um, uh, it suffices to have uh, a polynomial approximator. So it suffices to prove there exists a polynomial approximator with respect to the one norm, the absolute value less than epsilon uh, for learning. Um, and so again, this is sort of a this is sort of a simple observation. Um, you know, one ad additional thing that we observed was that not only do you get a pack learning algorithm if you can prove a polynomial approximator of this form, but um, you'll get an agnostic this implies an agnostic learning algorithm. And uh, typically, um, you know, at least in all the examples that I'm aware of, except for sort of what, what I'm going to talk about today, um, if you wanted to come up with a polynomial approximator in the one norm instead of the two norm, you would first prove the existence of a polynomial approximator with respect to the two norm, and then conclude, because it, that implies the existence of a polynomial approximator with respect to the one norm. So um, even though we knew that you needed something weaker, this kind of weaker, no, you know, weaker notion of approximation, still um, all of these noise stability techniques um, and kind of distribution specific techniques that I'm aware of um, end up first proving something stronger and then just uh, concluding this weaker statement. You know, if if I have, let me get through some other things, and then I'll and then I'll define it. Um, now, just because one time I gave this talk and I got into this digression about agnostic learning, and then like I ended up not giving the talk. Uh, so, you know, it, it, if you want to think about it, just um, it actually predates pack learning. It's it's very interesting, and it's just think about it in terms of the labels themselves are adversarially corrupted. So you get a random example, the label is adversarially corrupted with some noise rate. Okay. Uh, for these uh, noise stability, yeah. Every, well, every time that you're working, that you're proving a polynomial, you know, in this metric, uh, in this norm, uh, you know, and, and you're working with respect to a product space, like, I mean, typically it's going to be the Fourier polynomial. So, um, yes. Okay. So. Um, let's see. Yeah, so what we wanted to do was uh, something, uh, so, right, so, you know, noise stability, I mean, they're all, in a way, you know, Fourier-based techniques. They all require the underlying distribution to be a product space. And we wanted to do something um, for a more interesting class of distributions. So um, instead of this notion of noise stability, we, um, we're going to look at something called moment stability. Because if you recall the definition of noise stability, um, you know, it's the probability when you choose x, say over the hypercube, and then you choose y, which is a perturbed version of x, and you look at the probability that f of x does not equal f of y. Um, you know, this, this definition or this notion of noise stability doesn't really make sense unless the distribution is product. I mean, why are you flipping each bit independently um, if the distribution is not a product distribution, this doesn't really make sense. So we're trying to come up with, you know, we have something called moment stability. Um, so let me define it. So in order to define moment stability, what it means for a function to be moment stable, I have to define, uh, so we'll say distributions d1 and d2 are k moment matching. If for every 
monomial uh, of degree k x. Sometimes I'll write just x bar to denote a monomial. And um, if i is an index set indicating, uh, so i here will indicate like which power to take which particular variable to. I'll write x sub i sometimes as a monomial. If so, d1 and d2 are k moment matching. If for every monomial of degree k, x bar, the expectation of d1 of x bar is equal to the expectation of d2 of x bar. Okay, so those are so d1 and d2 um, match all their lower order moments. And then we'll say that f. Um, so f is k epsilon moment stable if for every distribution d prime such that, so I guess we should, so fix a distribution d, so fix some original distribution d. Then we'll say f is k epsilon moment stable with respect to d. If for every distribution d prime such that d prime and d um, are k moment matching, the expectation of uh, f with respect to d minus the expectation of f with respect to d prime is less than epsilon. So in words, what this means is that uh, you, you fix a distribution d, you have a function f, you say that it's k epsilon moment stable. If its expectation doesn't change too much when you kind of arbitrarily, um, say, zero out or, or truncate or, or, or um, mess with the, with the higher order moments. Okay, so if its expectation is stable as long, you know, as long as all of the lower order moments match, then we'll say that f is um, k epsilon moment stable. Is so Sorry? You're fixing both d and d. Yes. Right. So I, you, know, you could say f is k epsilon moment stable with respect to d. Yeah, good. So one easy th right. So exactly. So one easy thing to see, and that's leading into what I'm going to say next, is that um, if f is a degree k polynomial, then um, it's automatically moment stable. Yes, that's right. Yes, I'm going to get into that. Yeah. Right. So the again, sort of. Um, uh, sort of easy observation that I want to make that if f, so this is an obser easy observation. Well, it's not totally easy, but I'll talk about it in a second. So if f is k epsilon moment stable, with respect to d, then there exists a polynomial of degree k such that expectation of f minus p is less than epsilon. Okay, and in fact, um, um, these statements are equivalent. So uh, the proof is really um, LP duality. Um, and let, let me just say before I, I get more uh, into this, I mean, if you're familiar with the notion of um, trying to fool, you know, in pseudorandomness, you're interested in when k-wise independent distributions can fool various classes of Boolean functions that are defined on plus one, minus one to the n. Um, you know, if you were to choose the distribution d to be uh, the uniform distribution on the cube, then these notions exactly coincide. Uh, of, you know, a function, instead of saying it's k epsilon stable, you could just say that it's fooled by k-wise independent distributions. But for distributions that are not product 
uh, this notion of being fooled by a KY's independent distribution doesn't make sense um, because the original distribution wasn't a product distribution in the first place. So um, it seems like the right generalization instead, to, instead of saying you know, you're fooled by KY's independent distributions, the right generalization is to look at these moments and to say that you know, your expectation doesn't change too much for any distribution that kind of K moment matches the original distribution. And this notion will make sense for any distribution uh, as long as the moments are finite. So it doesn't work for every distribution, but it makes sense for a lot of distributions beyond um, you know, Ga uh, Gaussians or, or product spaces. Okay, so, um, so just very quickly, so the, the proof, um, you know, let me write down this, this linear program. So it's sort of it's a semi-infinite linear program. It's got a finite number of constraints, but it has an infinite number of variables. Here you're interested in this is like the expectation of f, the supremum over all distributions mu. Here you have a fixed um, sequence of moments for every low degree monomial. These are going to be the moments that come from the original distribution d, and this ensures that mu is a uh, a distribution. And if you look at the dual of this program, you get Sorry? Yeah, it should be non-negative. You're right. Um, look at the inf. So this turns out to be the dual. So you can see if f is k epsilon moment stable, then for any distribution that I put here that matches the lower order, that matches the first k moments, this supremum is at most the expectation of the original distribution plus epsilon. If you, that means that the infimum is at most by strong, well, so it turns out that strong duality holds in this case. It doesn't hold in general for semi-infinite linear programs, but for technical reasons in this setting, it does hold. And um, here we have, th this is, you can see there's a polynomial here. The sum of the, the a sub i's are going to be your coefficients, um, and it's going to be a, an upper sandwiching polynomial for f of x, and, um, you know, it's, its expectation is going to be at most the original expectation plus epsilon. So this gives you the upper bounding polynomial. It actually gives you sandwiching polynomials, but it's not important here. Uh, this will give you the upper polynomial. You can write another LP to get the lower bounding polynomial. But it, it's basically a, a, an application of strong duality that, that, that allows you to make this particular observation. OK, any questions on this? Um, in, um, in this setting where, see, these moments could be arbitrary values. And if they're totally arbitrary, then I can't say that this is an if and only if. But in the case where these values come from a distribution, which is the case here, you're always going to prescribe these sigma i's to be the moments of some fixed distribution, then yes, it is an if and only if. OK, so this gives us. Um, You don't get po po uh, point wise. You get you get an expectation. Um, okay, so this is sort of the framework that I wanted to work in, and um, typically, I guess I should say that uh, there, you know, for example, in pseudo randomness, you're typically interested in um, proving that. Um, some class of functions is fooled by KY's ind independent distributions, and you start from the fact that you have a polynomial approximator. Um, here, we're kind of going in the opposite direction. <clears throat> we want to prove the existence of a polynomial approximator. So we're going to try and prove that F is moment stable, which looks um, like a somewhat harder task. Um, and in a way, it is. But this is the general framework. Um, so I think one thing that's interesting about it is that you know uh, it will not produce an L2 approximator it will not give the type of approximators that 
um, sort of Fourier-based or noise stability-based techniques had given in the past. Um, this, this, it's an if and only if for the case where the sigma i's come from the moments of a distribution. Okay, right, right, you're right. Yeah, fair enough. Um, if it has a, if it has, a, if it has something called sandwiching polynomials, which is slightly stronger, then it will be moment stable. But strictly speaking, you're right. Uh, just the L1 approximator won't give it. Yes. Well, actually, um, I thought about that, and that actually makes your life easier in a way. But um, let me get into it later. Okay, um, so let me just, looking ahead, let me tell you that um, uh, here are the type of, basically here are the two conditions on distributions. So here, here are the two, you know, we're going to need something about the distribution in order to prove that certain functions are moment stable. And so the distribution um, should satisfy the following conditions. First of all, um, every marginal should obey a tail bound. By that I mean, so assume that um, assume that x is um, assume that the dis the distribution is isotropic, and x is chosen from D. Then we need that for all w of norm one, uh, the probability that W inner product x is greater than t is at most e to the minus t. So every marginal of this distribution should obey some type of sub-exponential tail bound. And also the distribution should be somewhat anti-concentrated. So that means that um, for all i, if you look at xi, the probability that xi is in t plus uh, e plus alpha uh, should be at most some function of alpha. Okay. Um, so if the distribution satisfies these two properties, then um, you know just looking ahead, it's it's we're going to be in good shape. And if you're familiar with log concave distributions. Um, you know that it satisfies both of these properties, uh, and that's sort of why, uh, you know, our main, one of our main applications, proving <coughs> approximators with respect to log concave distributions, that's, um, it, it falls into this category. Uh, yeah, e to the minus t is exactly where it starts to break down for the, the moments start to grow too fast. Okay, so now that we have this framework, um, you know, uh, for example, one interesting case is, you know, let's say that uh, F is a half space and D is, is some distribution that satisfies these two properties. Think of D as being, yeah, if you're familiar with log concave. How do you, how do you prove that, you know, a certain function with respect to a certain distribution is actually moment stable? How do we quantitatively actually prove bounds on this stability? So what I wanted to do is give you kind of state... Um, state just a few theorems uh, to give you a feel for the uh, what's involved with the techniques involved here they're, they're limit theorems um, and I should say that although you know we had to find these theorems in the literature and sort of digest them and understand them and they're slightly esoteric um, on the other hand I think that these questions are fairly natural you know if you have two it's a natural question you have two random variables their mo all their lower order moments match w you know What's, their, what's the CDF distance or the Levy distance between these two random variables? Uh, you know, it's, it's certainly not as strange. It, it seems like a natural question to ask, and so we figured that someone must have studied it, and um, indeed it has been studied. Um, so let me state a few technical theorems for you. Um, 
I guess I need to define two quantities, which if you're familiar with the problems from the classical method of moments will look familiar. Uh, so I'm going to define uh, mu j of random variable y to be the supremum over all t, norm of t is 1, of the expectation of t and y uh, raised to the j. And then I'm going to define beta k to be um, the sum from j equals 1 to k of uh, 1 over mu j of y to the 1 half. Okay, and so if you're familiar with like hamburger's moment problem, what? Is a 1 over j missing? I don't think so. I don't think so. What? Oh, oh, yeah. oh, you mean here? Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, so, if, like, if you're familiar with Hamburger's moment problem, like you're given a sequence, so it's just on the real line, you're given a sequence of moments from some particular distribution, and you'd like to know, does this sequence of moments uniquely define this particular distribution on the real line? It's an interesting problem. And there's something called Karlman's condition that will tell you when a sequence of moments uniquely identifies a distribution uh, uh, prescribed by these set of moments on the real line. And it involves a quantity like this. And it's true when this particular type of quantity diverges. Um, so it's, it's not too surprising that this shows up. So let me just state um, two theorems and a fact. Theorem one. Uh, it's due to Klebanov and Rakev from 96. So let, it says that if you have x and y, they're vector valued random variables. Um, so they're in RM. Um, let's see. So that for all t, in Rm, uh, Tx and Ty have identical 2k moments. Um, then the Levy distance between x and y is at most c times beta k to the minus one fourth times one plus something, it's not important, um, times delta. And I'll talk about delta in a second. And uh, we'll call this alpha. They have they have identical two uh, uh, they have identical moments the first two k moments. Okay, so that's this is sort of a theorem that gets you started. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, theorem two. Uh, this is due to Gabovich, 81, uh, plus a little, we did a little work here. Um, so pick n sub epsilon in R, such that the probability that um, x is not in this particular interval, minus n sub epsilon, n sub epsilon, uh, is less than or equal to alpha. So this alpha, these two alphas are the the same here. So you know you're you're starting with kind of x and y. Their first two identical 
2K moments match, um, you apply this theorem, uh, you, you get some bound here, alpha. I'm going to mention what delta, I'm going to talk about delta in a second, but um, you get some value here, alpha and capital delta. And then from this theorem too, if you choose this n sub epsilon so that this probability uh, is at most alpha, uh, then delta, this quantity that I talked about over here, is at most. Um, roughly log of n sub alpha plus log of uh, 1 over alpha raised to the m. So um, I'm not sure if that was very clear, but uh, uh, m here is x and y are vector valued random variables in Rm. No, it it does. I'm trying to simplify things. It's a it's a it's a it's a major mess. So, um, you know, maybe I should if I if I made slides like I would do everything in gory detail and you could see it all. But um, yeah. Oh, the Levy distance between x and y. It's a measure. It's a it's like um, if you're not familiar with Levy distance, you can think of um, imagine you have the CDF of x and the CDF of y, and you want to know kind of what's the small like I want to so I have my CDFs. And I want to know, like, what's the smallest side of a box I need to draw around x so that it covers the CDF of y? So it's some kind of notion of CDF distance of x and y. Um, smoothness assumptions in theorem 1. Um, I mean, I guess I would say that, like, this capital delta sort of encapsulates a smoothness assumption that you need to then apply theorem 2 in order to get something to work. Okay, theorem two, that's, uh, x not yes, x not in that interval. And then let me just say, um, so let me just say quickly fact 3. Um, so theorem, theorem 1, kind of this requires uh, a tail, the tail bounds from the marginals. This also requires tail bounds on the marginals. I'm just thinking about what properties of the distribution we're using here. And then fact three, we'll use anti-concentration. And it basically says, um, so assume that um, x in Rm is a random variable such that the probability it's of xi is in T um, T plus U. Um, uh, is less than some constant times nu. Um, then this implies that the CDF distance between X and Y um, is less than or equal to M times um, c times nu uh, I guess you know the takeaway since I want to get to something else let me just say that you know this this is sort of a very simple fact so you apply theorem 1 you get some distance between x and y in terms of levy distance it has this annoying as you would say smoothing parameter in it delta you can apply theorem 2 to get a bound on the smoothing parameter and then you can move from Levy distance to CDF distance using this notion of anti-concentration. And then um, sort of the application we had in mind uh, was, so we want to let uh, D be a log concave distribution. And we wanted F to be the characteristic function of a convex set. So we were interested in learning convex sets. And in particular, I mean, f could be any, um, well, any function of k half spaces. In particular, it could be the intersection of k half spaces, but 
um, you know, if you're interested in deep learning and you would like to do some um, function, you know, some type of neural network architecture, and you're interested in functions of k-half spaces, then this uh, framework will also hold. And uh, let me just tell you what happens when you look at the case of um, an inter intersection of k-half spaces and the distribution d is log concave. You can apply these theorems in a not too painful way to show that um, uh, let's see. So let me do. Let me say it's any function of m. Let me change from k to m here. So if f is any function of m half spaces, then f is k epsilon moment stable with respect to a log concave distribution. Um, and you have to choose k, unfortunately, to be large. It's exp, it's like doubly exponential. It's exp of log, log m over epsilon. m over epsilon to the fourth. Uh, I can't even parse this myself, but it's basically, uh, it's, it's slightly worse than doubly exponential in the number of half spaces that you're interested in, and epsilon an error parameter. Uh, but I guess I would say this is sort of a, I guess I should say that, um, so Daniel Kane also proved, he, he, didn't, he didn't use moment stability, but he, he proved that you could approximate um, functions of half spaces with respect to log concave distributions, and his bounds are only singly exponential. Um, I guess I should say that you know before this work, it wasn't clear how to uh, learn even the intersection of two half spaces uh, with respect to log concave distributions, even in the noiseless model. So unfortunately, um, the exponent, when, when I say it's a polynomial time algorithm, I mean the exponent is uh, enormous, but we're going to choose m to be 2 and epsilon to be some fixed constant. Right. Right. That's the point. Yeah. Uh, the, I guess the point is the degree of the approximating polynomial only depends on the number of half spaces and the error parameter epsilon. So one, uh, so let me just mention like one open problem. Um, so in this paper, we give a smooth, we actually show that, you know, we prove something more if you work in the smooth analysis setting where you get a random example and then um, that example is perturbed, the, its location is perturbed a little bit by a Gaussian. Uh, we can prove that you can do this entire framework in the smooth analysis setting and you can get rid of that, um, the need for anti-concentration. Uh, so you can do away with um, needing D to be anti-concentrated if you work in the smooth analysis setting. And one nice open problem is, um, you know, can you agnostically learn half space with respect to all distributions in the smooth setting? For all, if you want to do it not in the smooth setting, uh, we know that there. I mean, there are many hardness results, but I don't know why it shouldn't be possible to agnostically learn a single half space with respect to all distributions when the location of the marg the marginal distribution has been perturbed by some Gaussian. Um, so that that would be very interesting. I mean, one problem of extending this particular approach is if you wanted to learn a half space with respect to like a heavy tail distribution where the moments don't exist then of course you're going to have difficulty uh, applying this framework. But um, I think it's interesting to look at these learning problems that kind of seemed impossible or th where we have strong hardness results and, and maybe think that they're, you know, in the smooth setting they're not that difficult. For a single half space? No, for this question. Uh this one? Yeah. If uh, you don't exist on agnostically learning. Yeah, then it's easy, it's easy to learn a, a half space with no noise for every distribution. It's, it's an easy application of linear programming. And, uh, but 
But the agnostic, you know, when you want to learn it with respect to noise, if you then want to do it with respect to all distributions, it turns out it's, there are many types of hardness. There's cryptographic hardness results. There are many hardness results. But um, I don't know of these type of strong hardness results when you work in the smoothed analysis setting. Adam, what is the, what is the kind of smoothed analysis setting you're doing? What do you, how do you... So, um, okay, well, it, do we have time to take this question? Or? Am I done? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I can keep going? Yeah, it's a question from the organizer. What? Didn't I start at 10.15? Oh, okay, great, great. Okay, so. No, I just don't want to go over time. <laughs> uh, okay, so, um, okay, l let me just say something about the smooth setting. I'll define it. So, uh, okay, let me just mention, I'll quickly define agnostic learning. So. <laughs> yes, yes, Subash, you can leave. You can go. <laughs> Do you want to leave? Or? I'm cool, I'm cool, I'm not offended. There's a seat right up here. You can get a better view. But we should, uh, we should quest, uh, let's thank the speaker. <laughs> uh, now with more questions, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just answer for Gil what agnostic learning is. So you, um, so just fix, uh, fix a distribution. D on Rn cross minus one one. So it's a, it's so it's an arbitrary do joint distribution, and then um, you fix a function class f, and you define opt to be uh, the minimum over all f and f of uh, the probability when x and y is drawn from d uh, that uh, f of x uh, does not equal y. Okay, so opt measures the error of the best fitting function in your class with respect to an arbitrary di joint distribution on Rn cross minus 1, 1. So pack learning. the case when opt equals 0. So when there actually is a function in the class that properly labels every point correctly. But you can see that this is a, you know, when opt is non-zero, this is a much more difficult problem. And actually this, um, you know, it's tricky as to who to cite for the model of agnostic learning. I mean, you could, in some regard, credit Vapnik. Um, in a way, it predates pack learning um, because he had this notion. I mean, when when you find you know in machine learning, you're interested. You have some particular distribution. You're interested in finding a function that is the risk minimizer. This is the empirical risk minimizer, and that's what he had defined. I mean, also David Hausler defined um, a model, pretty much to had this model, and then Kearns, uh, Shapiri, and Selly um, are they're also typically credited for defining this model, um, but the Vatnik came this model in what so in some sense it precedes pack learning, um, so that's what so that's what agnostic learning is. You have to so you have to find an H such that um, the error of H with respect to D is at most opt plus epsilon. So you need to find a hypothesis. You're given random examples from D. You need to find a hypothesis whose error is at most the uh, opt, you know, the, the, the error of the best fitting function plus some particular epsilon. And really, you, want, you don't want two times opt here. You want you know, one times opt at, you want within additive epsilon. And then the, the smooth, the, so to answer Rocco's question, the smooth model is, so if x uh, is the marginal distribution, then instead of receiving examples from x, you receive examples from x plus z, um, where z is a Gaussian, and uh, the, the variance 
of z in every direction is at most sigma times the variance of x in that direction. So you look at a gal so you look at x, you look at its covariance matrix, or you know, you, you have its covariance matrix. You consider a Gaussian with the same covariance matrix but scaled by some sigma here less than one. And you then receive examples from the distribution x plus z from this new kind of joint distribution x plus z comma y. The no, the, well, the, 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 you're, you're getting examples from just some joint distribution, and it has a marginal distribution x. And now I'm saying instead of getting x comma y, you're going to get x plus z comma y. So that goes into opt as well. I mean, yeah. Yes, that goes in, that goes into opt as well, right? And then your running time is allowed to depend on sigma here. And as you can imagine, if sigma is getting closer, as sigma gets closer and closer to one the problem gets much, much easier because um, then the marginal distribution looks more and more Gaussian. And as sigma is small, it becomes a harder question. So in, in this paper, we give results for you know, functions of half spaces um, in the smoothed setting, but uh, you know, and the dependence is exponential on sigma. So we're really interested in the case when, again, sigma is a constant. Um, but it holds for distributions. Instead of just being log concave, you can work with like sub-exponential or sub-Gaussian densities, things that aren't unimodal. Um, you can get around that. Uh, so suppose the tail does not decay to the minus t, but say to the minus t point nine, is to point nine, something like that. No. So the moment conditions <laughs> won't hold good. But yeah. can you just so ignore the examples which are coming from? Where you yeah, that's a good question. We've like thought about that. Um, that'd be very interesting. I mean, we couldn't get anything to work, but yeah, that's that's interesting. You know, e to the minus t squared, is it easier? Oh, yeah. Then all of the bounds become exponentially better. You're getting a strong, you're having, you have a stronger tail bound than you're working with. about log concave is in most directions, so. Uh, yeah, I know. We've tried to use these facts about central limit theorems for log concave densities, and I, I can't get them to really work in this scenario. I mean, I consider these results to be sort of proof of concept that you can do something that we didn't know how to do before and, you know, not have to work with L2 approximators or use Fourier analysis. But, um, you know, the bounds that we get are sort of bad, and... I don't know how to extend them yet, so. Um, but uh, conceptually, I don't think it's difficult, you know, as to what's going on. So, so do you think these notions of uh, moment stability can replace uh, this Fourier analysis? Well, a everything that's noise stable is also moment stable, <coughs> so that's good. Um, and uh, you know, of course, I would like to push it as far as it can go, but I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, we were happy to be able to do, you know, convex sets and log concave distributions. So. Oh yeah, I should mention that Carl also has a paper that's um, that he's going to talk about. That's also like oh, about. Yeah. Oh yeah. What's your question, sir? <laughs> <laughs> My question was going to be: How does this apply to like the Boolean hierarchy when you try to apply these kinds of things? Yeah, it, you you can apply it. Um, so, for example, KY's independent distributions. We can learn with respect to KY's independent distributions. We didn't know how to do that before. Um, and we also have some alternate proofs for some other results on the cube um, that are in the paper for, like, degree two PTFs. Sorry, so, don't distributions over the cube have this very bad concentration? How does yeah, that it's a smoothed analysis. So you have smoothed analysis results for distributions over the cube? Yeah. How, what is the smoothing, then? Are the examples really from the cube, or they're from a... They're, cu they're cube points, but then they have to be perturbed. Um, I guess for the case of degree two PTFs, just regular uniform on the cube, we can prove, um, like we can give an alternate proof of Dyke, Nicholas, Kane, and Nelson using this framework. It's a simpler proof, but it's worse parameters.